Over the course of your career, you've been described in many ways. Risk taker, a visionary, a hot-tempered micromanager. Uh, your book itself is called Relentless. Uh, yet in, in your preface, you say you're just an ordinary guy. How do you describe yourself? Well, I, um, it's hard to describe yourself. Um, I worked very, very hard. Um, I didn't do that well at school. Um, I'm not the brightest guy in the room. Uh, but I'm probably, I try to be the best prepared. And that's really important for you, isn't it? You think that takes you a long, long way. Well, it does, because the, the person who's so smart often wings it, and uh, you catch them out. So that's what's important. Now, you write fondly about uh, your father, who died yes. when you were very young. You're only five years uh, old, and that, he, and that he truly was a visionary. I mean, he'd... He invented the alternating current, too. Right. And, uh, and this, is a, this is basically a radio that didn't need batteries. Did not need batteries. Which was revolutionary at the time. That's right. And he started manufacturing them um, in 1925. Uh, started CFRB in 27. In order to sell more radios. Yeah. <laughs> and had a TV license in 31. So he died, however, at, at age 35 or 7, whatever it was. In 1935, uh, and uh, uh, everything we had in those businesses was either uh, shut down, lost, stolen, and they were all taken. Above and beyond the loss, material and otherwise, I mean, you, you basically say that his, his life, his presence in, in whatever form, is really what shaped you more than anything else. Well, it was really my mother who said at age eight, your job, Ted, is to get those, get the name of Rogers back in the communication. So your mother was as, as determined as you were. To be well, honest. more so. You have tragedy very, very early in your life as your, uh, as, as your uh, father died. And you go to Upper Canada College in, uh, in, in boarding school. What was that like? Terrible. Um, because you were in boarding, but you were so close to home. You only lived a few blocks from home. Did you feel abandoned? A bit. It was a war. My second father, John Graham, who was so good, he was overseas. Right. My mom was an alcoholic, um, so maybe it was for the best. But your your stepdad comes home after the war, and they keep you. That in, was a disappointment. In boarding school for five years. I mean, that must have been beyond disappointment. It's been traumatic. It was. Again, my mother was an alcoholic, and there were a lot of family problems and. You just you have to roll with the punches. A lot of your viewers out there today, they've had their own difficulties, their own travails, travails, and uh, you have to put up with them and overcome them. And and if you do that, you're a better person for it. Overcome them, you did. I mean, you make the point that while at uh, at UCC, even in even as a boy, you were fascinated with television and radio, and you tell right. the story about it being able. And this was kind of pre-television being widely uh, available, putting an antenna outside the dorm and charging uh, <laughs> people to, to watch television. I mean, was it clear even, even then when you were in grade school that you wanted to be an entrepreneur, you wanted to make money through telecommunications? Well, uh, the money part of it is sort of comes naturally um, if you're successful. Um, you, you don't do it to make money. People who go into business just to make money, um, you know, my best wishes to them. Uh, but you need more than that, I think. You need to have a passion. The key word is passion. There's passion, there's perseverance, but there's also something else. Uh, and that I, th I think is very, very important reading, reading this book. It's part of your career, and that's an appetite for risk. You have to be, be able to or want to. I mean, you're, you, I can remember in the day, I'm old enough to, that when Rogers Communications, whenever anyone talked about it, it was debt-soaked Rogers, how can this company ever make money, it loses money. You loaded that company up with so much debt, everyone wrote, 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 you, uh, wrote you off. Yet you were prepared to take that risk. Why? Well, I mean, it's the only way. I didn't have any money. <laughs> and I needed money to, to fulfill a dream. 
There was only a one answer, so that's what we did. Now, is that faith? Is that passion? Or is that, do you have to have, that would be stomach churning for most people. They would just say. Well, it, yeah, it's, it's not easy, uh, but you have to have uh, conviction. So there's another key word, conviction. I remember interviewing Bill Gates, and he said every two years, for the first 20 years of Microsoft, we bet the company. Yeah. And you've done that throughout your entire career. That's you know, whether right. it was cable, a specialty t a TV, wireless, internet, you bet the company. That's right. And you could have lost it all. That legacy that was so important to you, the Rogers name. Yeah, we could have lost it a second time. Now, even as a law student, you, uh, you were able to cobble together some money and uh, get an FM license. That was difficult because... Only 5% of the homes had FM. Well, so I was going to say, no one even listened to FM. It was considered a dog. What did you see there? Well, oh, a higher quality sound. Right. Um, it was better. It had to win in the end. It will win in the end. You've just got to write it out. So you were able to say that, that at the end, that quality of technology was going to be superior over time. It would beat AM. Of course. Then you go and you hook up with the Eatons and the Bassets. They had money. They had money. And you were part of the CFTO license, the first right. CTV uh, license. How old were you at this point in time? Oh, 30 odds. Like Why would they want even you to hang around here? They had lots of money. What did they need you for? Because I was, uh, the, I was very enthusiastic. Um, I was enthusiastic and well-known amongst uh, the people that we were talking to, both in Toronto and Ottawa. And uh, I was uh, just a hard-working guy. I knew the business. You also knew, and I, and I think throughout your career, a lot of business people don't fully appreciate this, you also understood how government worked. You were a political junkie. You loved politics. And at the end of the day, in the broadcast business, you've got to get license from the CRTC. You've got to know how that system works. Well, my, my longtime pal, Phil Lind. Who's been your vice expert, chair for years. He's expert at that. And, uh, but he's been with you his entire adult life. That's right. We, we've we've uh, gone through so many things. Um, he, he wasn't involved in that particular no, thing. No, it was but, before that. But uh, he's certainly been a major contributor. But you've been smart, you were smart enough to know that your right-hand man had to be someone who knew something about government. Well, he's, he's made a major contribution. You're too modest. Now, in 1967, you form Rogers Cable TV. And again, we have to remember now, this is Expo. No one had cable. It didn't exist. Everyone well, had... That's the thing in business. Get into something that nobody has and ride the growth up. But what did you see about cable? At this time, everyone was happy with over-the-air broadcasts. We all had our rabbit ears. One simple thing, and Phil was involved, one simple thing. Um, in those days, a TV station had... Uh, ethnic programming on Saturdays, right? And it had news at certain times, and sports at certain times, and drama at certain times. And I realized that people wanted to be able to tune in and get sports whenever they wanted it, you know, whatever, whatever they, wherever they were. And we would need more and more channels, more channels than we had over the air. In the, in the spectrum. It wouldn't work. So you need to put fiber into a house. Now, these days, not when in cables, in the early days of cable, uh, it wasn't like today where you have, you know, two or three big dominant companies out there. This, these were little wee tiny mom and pop shops, by and large. Dentists would own uh, t rights to 2,000, to carry 2,000 homes, this sort of thing. You started gobbling them up very, very quickly. I did my best. <laughs> You also had, again, your old friends, the Bassetts and the Eatons, in as partners in, uh, in your early company. The CRTC says, uh-uh, eh -eh, not allowed that to happen. Someone who has a broadcast license, these guys, they forced you, or the Bassetts and the Eatons, the Baton, basically, to sell out. You thought this was going to be a disaster at the time. Well, uh, no, I, I, we, uh, my wife and I bought them out mm -hmm. and almost went under. We came within a half an hour of going under. So you were afraid. Decision. And this, your, your wife, Loretta, had to get into the family trust fund in order to... Oh, that was long since gone. <laughs> uh, You'd spent it all by then. But at 11.30 at night, uh, we went and signed the papers. And we would have lost the business at midnight. 
So you bet the company again. Yeah. The Bassus and the Eatons were good people. Mm -hmm. They were really good partners, and they gave me every break. Now, fast forward, you've got the cable operation up, you're gobbling up other uh, companies. I wouldn't uh, say gobble. Well, you're, you're, you're acquiring, and that you're, you're doing swaps in different regions in order yep. to consolidate. Two and two equals 22. Exactly. A big part of your career is also a, a tale of battling right. the telcos, the big telephone companies, and especially Bell. Bell has no interest in cable in, uh, in, in the early days. Thank God. They just missed the boat. Thank God. Nice people. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you forged ahead anyway and got into wireless. You know what's so funny? They had a man here running Ontario, Jim Thackeray, a very, very nice man. And I had no money now, just no money. And so Phil and I went to see him and, uh, and borrow, to borrow some money. Ma imagine going to your competitor to borrow some money. I had nowhere else to go. So you're going anywhere. So we went to him and he was... He was very good. He, he made us a loan, and it was nine months or a year or something. And I said, well, I'll prepay it if, if I can. And uh, actually, we did. We, we prepaid it after seven months. And Jim Thackeray said to Phil, why was Ted, why did he prepay it? He could have kept the money for the full year. And Phil said, well, it's because Ted gave you his word he would. He may want to come back, Jim. It's establishing that, that credit worthiness. <laughs> right. You've got a board now, you're a public company, and you say, I want to go and get into the wireless business. Not only does your board say no, your wife, Loretta, your partner, says, I don't think this is a very good idea at all. So you go offline, you invest outside of Rogers Communications. Right. And you bring in, uh, bring parts. What did you see? What, what again, what, give us some sense of your thinking. Why do you think people were going to want to walk around with a cell phone at this particular point in time? Oh, because you don't want to be tethered in your home, tethered to a wall. Um, it's much easier to have it in your pocket. You look on the street now, everybody's walking around. Oh, it's, it's ridiculous. We, we, we're hard pressed to know how we could live without our cell phones. Right. But the point is that others weren't seeing this. Well, somebody's got to see it <laughs> or it won't happen. <laughs> but is that good luck or, or, or a real sense of vision? It's, uh, well, let's go, don't back be modest to, now. let's go back to my dad. Uh, he used to travel around. He used to travel around and and visit other places, and talk to people, and listen, and make notes. Do it at four or five places, and he sit down with all those notes and write his own. And I learned to do that, and out of that came a picture, and the result was that wireless telephony seemed to be certainly something that was inevitable and was coming, had to come, had to. Why would anybody want to be tethered to the wall? Another theme that runs throughout uh, your career and certainly the industry that you've chose to be in is kind of the conflicting impulses between competition and monopoly. I mean, wanting kind of to get into fields where you're not in, but you know, wanting to ensure that once there, that they're not completely uh, unfettered. Talk to me about the allegations in the wireless business right now that we need more competition, that Canada is, is not price sensitive, that we don't have as good a service as we could if there would have been more competition. Well, if you got all weekend. <laughs> um, the, the numbers show that Canada, um, being a thin population base over 3,000 miles, is extraordinarily expensive to wire up for cellular. And... Uh, and not a good place to invest. But, but it's worked in Canada, it's worked beautifully. So much so that in many respects, we're the leader mm -hmm. in the world. So then these people come in from outside and say, these people have made it so successful, we ought to get in on it. And uh, I don't blame them, but uh, it's like the farmer who was farming wheat and nobody else was farming wheat and then his neighbor put in wheat the next year, and then three other neighbors put in wheat the year after. Pretty soon the price of wheat declined so much that nobody could make any money. But uh, the, the wheat eater, the consumer would say, fantastic. Yeah, um, you know what happened. There was a, um, 
uh, somehow all the wheat disappeared. And look, you know, until recently, look what's happened to our wheat. Your early venture into wireless, you had uh, partners, the Bellsbergs and, right. the, and the Bobians. Uh, Philip de Gaspé Bobian has been quoted as saying, Ted Rogers is a great friend, but not so good a partner. And I'm saying that because at the end of the day, you were able to dominate. To be a great entrepreneur, do you have to have a killer instinct? Do you have to want, you know, be prepared to win, even if it means losing a friend? Uh, yes. Um, and particularly in a growth industry where huge sums are needed to be invested, um, sometimes the people who started with you don't have the resources or the interest. They're in other businesses. And uh, it just isn't going to work. Also, in that particular case, there was nobody in charge. Mm. It no, wasn't, it wasn't as if Bobian was running it or, or Bellsberg was running it or Rogers. Nobody was running it. I was the closest to it. But then these guys would come along and, and uh, want to change it. And uh, <laughs> that, that's a problem for me. <laughs> you couldn't tolerate that. No, one time, one time I was arguing with uh, uh, the head of Bell he, on the phone, long distance. And uh, he got so mad at me, he says, well, if you know so much, why don't you come down and run Bell? And I said, well, all right, in that case, you come up and run Rogers. So somebody's got to run the joint. At the end of the day, your business is really customer service. Yes, I mean, it is. It's customer loyalty, and you have to reduce churn and all these other things that you guys in, in, uh, in the industry to, uh, talk, talk about. You admit in the book that the whole notion of negative option billing, basically you know, causing people to have to inform you whether they didn't want services, uh, was, a, was, a, was a mistake. The iPhone was very controversial, too, in terms of cost. How do you ensure that you do those two things at the same time? Forge uh, customer loyalty and maximize shareholder profit. Ha! You don't. <laughs> you don't. Um, two big mistakes like that out of almost 50 years. And if I may and, say... And you've admitted they were mistakes, both, too. bad. No. And you admitted they were mistakes, oh, both. Of course they were. Um, you get out of touch. Um, now, the first one, the commission wanted us to sell these new services. Right. These they'll they, admit that. Were, this is when they were bundling in the, or the yeah, early days of specialty TV. they would be TV. on the phone, Do, Ted, what are you doing? What are you doing? And so we dreamed up these things. And uh, what we came up with was not popular, wasn't fair. And uh, we took the heat for it. I took the accountability for it. I still do. That... Um I remember going to a dinner, and you, uh, you were there with a bunch of your marketing and salespeople, and you were telling them about what was going to happen next in the, in the industry, which is kind of ironic, you know, because here was the, the old proprietor knowing more than the young, smart kids. You've, you've always been noted for what's going to happen next. What's the next big thing in your view? Well, the way I'm able to do that is by being prepared and listening to people, not just people within 50 feet of you, but people all over the place. Yeah, you're very plugged in around the world, aren't you? You can pick I'm up the phone. I'm trying to be. I really work at it. And talk to Gates and talk to Buffett and talk to McCaw. Well, you know, no, those, those are pretty high, high-tone high people. I don't claim to, to do that. But I, I, I go and talk to more engineers and um, IT people. and Anyway, it seems to work. So what is the next big thing in your view? What's gonna, what, what do you think is going to really kind of change the, the whole game of telecommunications? Well, I think miniaturization is going to continue. Um, I think this notion of being able to listen uh, or, or view uh, uh, programming or information at a, at a time that you choose, at a location that you choose, is going to grow. That's huge. You wanted to get both the Rogers name associated with telecommunications out there, but you also wanted to get CFRB back. Of course. And to this day, you still want to get that, uh, that station back? No, I changed 20 years ago <laughs> because Loretta said to me, my wife said wife. to me, 
you uh, you have enough radio stations in Toronto, they make you sell one, and these people are all loyal to us, so you you should not do that. The 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 Blue Jays and the conversion of the Sky Dome to the Rogers Center. I mean, what's your thinking there? Uh, marketing, marketing. Brand. Yeah, brand building, and it has done that because they were going to move the team to the states, mm. and uh, I, I didn't. I'm a nationalist and. I didn't think that was a good thing to do. And I think a lot of people have moved over and supported the Rogers brand because of our support for, for that team. Yet on the other side, I mean, you're, you're associated with wanting to bring the NFL to Toronto, and a lot of people think that would be the death of a national institution, the CFL. <laughs> you know, it's so easy to, to claim that any step in progress is going to harm something existing. Sports, uh, telecommunications or anything. I've heard that whine all my life. Uh, they don't explain why. For example, um, you, would, you would package the, the game so on a weekend here in Toronto, you'd have both teams play. Uh, you'd, you'd have build it around a, a celebration for all football. Out west, it isn't uh, the risk. It isn't. No, no, it's still very strong on the Western Canada. But here, working together, uh, we gave them, for example, their people, the choice of the first 20,000 tickets. And then afterwards, they had the nerve to complain. If, if, they don't, if they don't like it, they shouldn't take the benefits. Canada's super rich have had a poor record of philanthropy until uh, until recently. I mean, do you believe that you have a responsibility to give back some of what you've earned? Oh, of course, and to teach your children to do the same thing. Uh, now, uh, the uh, the governments have have uh, loosened up and made it easier for people to donate to right. charity. And Don Johnson, who's a very energetic a uh, person on uh, Bay Street and a good friend of mine has worked tirelessly to uh, try and facilitate this. And as a result, uh, the amount that is given is increased. Yes, and we also, Loretta and I believe that, look, you can give money for the immediate food banks or this and that, but tomorrow it's gone. Whereas if you give money for scholarships and bursaries and so on, and it, it lasts over, over generations. So you're investing in your philanthropy the same way you've invested in business. That's right, and you, you, you've made it so that their world becomes uh, much more middle class, that the whole community becomes wealthier. Wealthier not just in dollars, but wealthier intellectually, spiritually, uh, in every way. One of your more recent gifts is to Ryerson University where you set up the Rogers School for Management. What do you want young entrepreneurs to be taught today? Oh my goodness, um, I don't think I'm qualified to, uh, to answer that. Um, and not in terms of curriculum, but in terms of values, in terms responsibility of... Responsibility would be one. Social uh, and, and community responsibility. Yeah, and uh, looking after your brother. You end uh, the book, and, and a lot of the focus, the press focus of this, is on succession. Right. Uh, it's sexy. <laughs> I, I, I guess so. I guess so. First, I mean, how long do you want to stay in your uh, job as CEO? Well, I love it, and I'd like to stay for as long as feasible. Um, I have had these, this heart problem, and uh, it doesn't get any easier. So I think it's a little bit up to the good Lord. By that, I don't mean passing away or anything. I mean, you get to a certain stage where it would be wise to, to uh, put in a new CEO. Uh, there's two things. One is the CEO to run the business day to day, month to month. And the other thing is for the family to name somebody who would be the long-term, in charge of long-term planning. Long -term. You're right about this. The succession planning for you is really on two tracks, isn't it? On two it? tracks. And Edward has been chosen by me and by this Will. This is your son, Edward. To, uh, to be the second one. Uh, now, he and Melinda would, would like desperately to also be the CEO, but that will be up to a board committee and then the board. And uh, 
and we have, as you pointed out, a fair number of very talented and experienced people. And so right now it would be, uh, despite my being so proud of everything Edward's done, he's been there for 17 years. He's done every crappy job there is. He's not been spoiled. He's met his targets. So he says, well, why, why not me? And he's right, except that there are others that have more experience. And the board will have to make that decision. It's too hard for a father. A hundred years from now, we have uh, Rogers nanotechnology implanted in our brains that hook us up with our computers and, and, and the world. How do you want people to talk about Ted Rogers? Oh, I hope they, they, they I never even thought about that. But I, in a balanced way, um, a balanced way, person, people who do things, who are active, who are making things move, they're going to be right, hopefully most of the time, but they're going to be wrong some of the time. And to just understand that you can't move things along unless you're willing to be wrong some of the time. Someone said if you hit the bullseye all the time, you're standing too close to the target. Well, or you've, you've just not tried at all. But listen, I've, I've led the good life. I've been so lucky. I have a wonderful wife, Loretta, who's an artist. She paints and she's, a, she's an outstanding person in so many ways. I'm enormously lucky to have married her and four wonderful kids. And uh, I, I don't know what, what else to say. I hope, I hope in the future they'll say, well, he, he admits that he should have spent more time with his family, but he did end up with a hell of a good family. Ted Rogers, I want to thank you very much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, sir.